Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jack O'Connor, Federal Programs Director from the State of Montana, and I'd like to welcome you to our session this morning, Simplifying Science of Reading Instruction, a Backdoor Approach for Easy Accessibility. As a reminder, I would like you to note that you'll be able to watch this session and any other session um, right after the conference is over on Title I On Demand. The reason I'm telling you that now is in the next hour and a half, you're gonna get more information than you can possibly write down. I have never heard anybody speak as fast as Katie. Um, so I'll just do it this way right now as my high school bus driver, Wally Black, used to say, sit down, shut up, and hang on. And with that, I would like to introduce Katie Gardner, uh, author, researcher, colleague, and friend. Uh, please help me in welcoming Katie to the stage. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you got up early and came, and um, we are going to zoom through, just like Jack said, a bunch of information because the whole goal is to simplify this, this overwhelming thing that if you're here, you may actually have this as an initiative in your district, in your schools, science of reading, looking at what we know about the brain and how we teach kids to read. But that information, there's a lot of it. And it's not always feeling like the best show for the audience that it's gonna be delivered to, who at the start is five, and eating their shoe, right? Licking the carpet. And yet we're talking about high-level terminology and abstract concepts that are enough to make teachers a little trepidatious about how to attack the learning that goes with all of this. And depending on when you went to college, uh, most of us never got any kind of code-based training so imagine being like in the Navy, and you're supposed to be a Morse code operator, but you don't have the code. You know, it's hard to crack the code without the code. And yet we've been kind of trying to do that in different ways, and it just can't ultimately be um, something that's accessible to all learners, many of which actually rely on having a code-based process to figure it out. But it doesn't have to be code as we think of phonics, and that's really what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at the neuroscience and ways to cheat, ways to take backdoor um, paths, both for teachers and for students, because everything I'm talking about really is just as accessible for teachers trying to come into this and make sense of it as it is for students trying to come into it and make sense of it. Um, of course, isn't it funny that as soon as I start talking, my watch starts vibrating and beeping and buzzing, so I'm just going to take it off. Um, as we look at what we know about how to teach reading, the other challenge that teachers have beyond just gaining the knowledge is having deliverable buckets to carry that to the end user, who again, we're teaching reading at the primary grade levels. Now we might have a ton of kids with holes, and we do, and those holes have to be plugged because they've moved on through the grade levels, especially during the pandemic, and they've missed out on pieces they were supposed to be um, gathering along the way. But the beauty of the code is, like a Morse code operator would know, is the code never changes. Just the message, the text level to which the code's applied, which means we're really all sitting at the same table, the same building blocks that we use to read the word the, that TH, is in thrombosis. So whether it's a five-year-old or it's a medical textbook, these words are just made up of these code-based building blocks. And once we have a way to access them and to deliver them to the littlest of the learners, or to the learners who struggle the most, then we can take that and run with it at whatever level we're, we're actually working with, whatever that text level is. So we're gonna look at this backdoor approach, and I'm gonna leave you with a ton of tools. So to access those, what I want to do is show you where a handout is. Now I also wanna show you where there's like a debriefing um, area to go to after session, and that is this Facebook group. Um, it's almost 80,000 educators strong. It's only about two years old. And it is everything from teachers to principals to literacy coordinators to district admin, um, curriculum directors, all different layers and levels and lenses that, that we're looking at this kind of backdoor access approach through. And ways that this kind of fans out in their district, their state, their country, um, with their students. So what's really nice about that is if you go and you search in the search box, you know, things that you're dealing with, you're very uh, likely to be able to pull up conversations from um, either folks in a similar area where you live or with student populations who might struggle with the same things or the level that you're actually working with or your level 
and your position. So it's a really good place after session to go ask questions. Um, we'll be posting some of what you're gonna have here um, in there. So I'm gonna show you how to get to your packet, but you'll actually be able to have access to it either um, in this group or on the website for the conference. So I'm gonna show you how to get there on your own after the fact if you don't wanna have to try to search back to a conference site or go here. But to get here, you can just either search this, Science of Reading Meets Science of Learning, or you can use your download link on your conference app um, because you'll have access to get to it either way. Now, to find the handout anytime, all you have to do, and it is updated, like every few months, things shift, and I, I try to put different pieces into it. It's about a 75-page pack, so it's really meaty, but anything I show, I share. So there are downloadable, clickable arrows on different slides that lets you go off kind of into a rabbit hole on certain topics. So if there's something that I touch on but it's really interesting to you, um, you can go off and either access a video about it, find the research directly that it's related to, download maybe the anchor pieces that you need to enact that strategy. So there's all different kind of ways to play. And you'll see these little clickable arrows at the bottom of each PDF slide. To find the PDF packet with all these slides, you're gonna either go to thesecretstories.com or katiegarner.com, which is my speaker website. Or since this conference has an app, you don't have to go anywhere. You can just log into your app and it's right there. But if you ever don't have access to your app, you go here and it's really easy to find. You just look at the top, find where it says conferences, workshops. I think this just says workshops, but I think now on the site it says conferences, workshops. Click on that and you'll see a drop down window and you just wanna pick session handout packet. And as soon as you do that, it'll pop up and then you can download it to your desktop. To make those clickable arrows work to access these other pieces, you will have to have it on your desktop. So if you try to access it through the PDF viewer, you'll be clicking and nothing's gonna happen. So make sure you transfer it over. I'm gonna show you one piece that you're absolutely gonna wanna download if you work with the earliest level learners. Now I've already said we're gonna look at this whole gamut. So whether you're working with struggling older learners, we're talking even adult or ELL, or the very you know, bottom pre-K where really all of the research is showing the impact that we can have, not just on those connections, but actual mass in the brain um, when we can get in there early and get in there faster. But if you teach or if you work with or you're over teachers who are working with the, the earliest grade learners or ELL, and you focus on or struggle with the alphabet. I'm talking just individual letters and sounds. Not the tricky stuff where letters come together and make different sounds. Just like B says B, C says K, and S. So if you teach, let's say, pre-K or kinder, or you're over those levels, can you raise your hand? Oh, wow, then you guys are gonna, this is your prize. <laughs> Except you guys are all gonna get it too on the sides. Um, there's something called the better alphabet, and it is the fastest way on planet Earth literally, to give, not teach, every possible sound a letter can make by itself. Every possible sound a letter can make by itself in two weeks to two months. And it's done, and it's over, and it's finished. Now, I don't mean it's not gonna be used, you're gonna use it constantly alongside this other thing we're gonna talk about, which are these phonic secrets, ways to make sense of what letters do when they don't do what they should. But the point is they have to have first access to all those individual sounds. And you can't spend a year doing it because it arms you with nothing to read and write with. Even if you have all the individual letters and sounds, you still can't read or write anything, which you're gonna see in just a minute. So we gotta knock it out quickly and fast, and we can't rely on things that may not be in place, like auditory um, uh, discrimination for sound, sound variation, or articulation, or language uh, processing, or working memory, or even just attentiveness. You know, kids, when they're little, they want to eat their shoe and literally roll around the carpet. They don't care what a D says. They don't even know what a D is. And they certainly can't use it for anything yet. So this is a trick that you want to keep up your sleeve. Not even just early grade teachers, but also if you work with kids who are coming from different language backgrounds, they're going to have exactly the same needs. You know, fast access quickly, getting that, getting that stone turning. Now I'm going to show you what I want to show you with this clip. This little girl's doing a little part of it. This is pre-K. And all that this clip is for is really to show you the non-conscious skill retrieval. She's not doing what normally you'd have to do when you're trying to recall a skill 
which is you think, your, your, you can even see the eyes shift position as you look up and to the left and you're trying to recall information. None of this is happening. It's rolling right off her lips, tongue, and teeth as any song might. Now, it's not gonna fall into the trap of a song because the problem with a song is it goes on autopilot. We don't want that, especially for letters and sounds because we have to manipulate them. But the reason it doesn't is the tune starts over on every single letter pattern. It's called a melodic mnemonic. And what it means is wrapped into the rhythm and wrapped into the pitch are these sound symbol connections that are part of the words that are being said. So it's all coming out kind of on a flow or on a roll. Now you're gonna see this and you're also gonna see her doing this. Now keep in mind this is pre-K. She's doing this because the other half of this puzzle that's so critical is kids have to see what they sing and they have to sing what they see. The whole point of reading and writing is this mapping of sound symbol connection in the brain. When kids see a, a symbol, a letter, a phonics pattern, sound has to pop right out of their mouth. When they hear a sound, like they're trying to write a word and they're trying to make the sound they need, they have to instantly have a symbol that connects with the sound that they're making. That sound symbol connection is key. So if we only rely on the lips, tongue, and teeth, this muscle memory, to give this automatic recall, it's of no value if there's not a symbol that goes with the sound. So what I love is, we, we call this eye glue and muscle mouth. And in the group that I was talking about, that Facebook group, you can see teachers, there's a huge free download file set. It's like a big file cabinet. And it's all kinds of resources to play like this. And so some of the teachers and some of the different districts have made these like mouth muscle eye glue awards, just ways to really encourage kids to do what this little girl's doing, which is she is pointing like this to whatever they normally are looking at when they sing. Because the teacher's filming, they're obviously looking at the teacher. But it's driving her crazy because you can tell she's been really well trained to know that you've got to be looking, you've got to have your eyes glued on those letters. So you can just kind of see that she's not okay with the fact that we're not looking at the letters while we're singing this song. And that tells me the teacher's done an amazing job at setting all that up. But I want you to just watch the ease with which these kids are recalling these otherwise abstract skills. A, B, C, B, 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 C, 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 now, that's just a second of it, but did you hear both sounds for C? Because C doesn't just say K, it also says S. But most likely sound is K, that's what comes out first. That's important when you're looking at a course of attack. As a reader, what's the most likely sound to try for C that's gonna be successful? And that is K. But if that doesn't work, what do I have up my sleeve to immediately shoot out right after the fact? So that's what we want, yes. And the fact that that can just roll out. I don't know if you noticed it, but this is what this next clip is for. Um, she or they were repeating the tune on every single letter grouping. That's, it, that's critical because otherwise this is a song that's locked together, which means kids can't do what she's about to do, which is pull out of context any letter name and the sound pops out. You know, what if I don't remember what W says or what K says or what D says? I don't want to have to sing an entire song starting at A to get all the way to W to then know what sound it is. I need to be able to sing on the W and have the sound pop out of my mouth. And even I'm surprised that it was there because I didn't know I knew it, because I didn't really know it. It was coming from a different part of the brain. Muscle memory is an earlier developing area of the brain. Just like the other points that we're gonna make today come from earlier developing areas of the brain that are not reliant on these factors that that are markers of what we see with kids who are dyslexic, what we see with kids who struggle with many other um, reading delays and disorders, a lot of those markers are very consistent. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of conversation around dyslexia and dystichia. Because while there is organic dyslexia, there's also a lot of outcomes that can present with those same features when kids miss the boat on certain types of instruction. Not all kids, some kids. Some kids are gonna make it through and they'll figure it out. But there are other kids who really need to hit certain marks in order to have these things make sense. Or we can cheat and hit those same marks, but not be waiting on readiness that for some kids is gonna to come too little you know, and too late. So this little girl's pulling things. It's actually a letter sound assessment. The teacher, this was posted in the group. I don't know this teacher, but I loved this because it made my point. So I didn't have to say as many words to get it across. She said, in September, this sweet kindergartner was still four. She wasn't able to give me any letters or sounds. We sang the Better Alphabet song every day. You actually have to do it twice a day. Um, and I would even hear the kids singing on their way home when they were partnering. Um, fast forward to the first week of November, watch what she can do. Can you hear her beautiful dialect? There's a second language spoken at home. 
Now the teacher's just pointing to different letters. The little girl has to sing the letter name and sing the sound or sounds that it makes. And they're going all out of order. And again, there's no break between the letter name and the letter sound, which shows you it's connected. It's embedded, it's forged together. Normally, if you've ever done a letter sound assessment, the child will say, you'll say, what's this letter? And they'll say, uh, G. And you'll say, okay, what does G say? And they have to think for a minute. Like, it's not connected instantly where the G and then the G and then the J come out. They're just, they're not forged like that. It's a retrieval process. It's a, it's a recall, a cognitive recall of a skill connection that you've built in some capacity, either by pretending to be a giraffe or doing sign language, whatever it might be. With this, it's not, because we want to keep our eye on the letter, and our lips, tongue, and teeth are what we're relying on to pull the sound. So you can watch that and notice there's no break between her saying the letter name and the sound. They come out together, and they come out with the song, but in totally random order, which is so important, because that's the way they're going to be used to actually read and write. How about this one? Hey, says... A says but you can also say a a a a a a a yes yes hello says yes D says why says but you can also say e o i o e yes now there's a reason she said it can also say e or i or e because if you've ever looked at a calendar you know we these are the lies about letters that we tell we say why says yo yo yeah 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 but it doesn't and it won't almost ever because just look at the calendar alone. We've got words like February, E, July, M, A. That's the boys' bathroom. Our favorite words are mommy, daddy, candy. Every book is but I, a certain author. Good luck ever finding the letter Y saying yeah anywhere in a print rich classroom other than the words yellow, yes, you, and yak. That's it. Like a thousand to one, it's going to say almost everything else other than the one sound that we normally would assess kids' mastery of saying that it makes. And actually, if the brain's a pattern-making machine, which it is, the worst answer they could give is that Y says, yeah. That's its least likely sound, other than maybe, buh. So it's, so it's so interesting how it's so much harder to be opposed to the, the natural patterns of highest frequency occurrence. And all of those possible sounds for Y live on her lips, tongue, and teeth. Now, to put that into play requires something else. And I'll, actually, I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I don't want to do that. But this is... This is the next step to using music in a way that research shows is actually the most useful, which is to flip-flop, twist, and turn what you think you know to see if you really know that you know it, which allows you to raise the bar on the learner. And that is critical because what we want is to give them the decoding and encoding experience, but without any pressure or stress in a way that's really fun, but the bar is super high. And even if they fall flat on their face, they get excited and they want to keep trying it and do it again. And there's no pressure of the book that's gonna give them the huffy breath because it's hard and they feel like they're not good at it. You know, kids who are poor readers will avoid reading like the plague. We love to do what we're good at. That's why your avid readers never put the book down. They get in trouble because they're trying to read when they're not supposed to. Your kids who know they aren't good readers avoid reading because they feel like a failure when they do it. And the more they avoid it, the worse they get. The worse they get, the less they do it. The kids who are great readers, same thing. I mean, they, they love it. They do it all the time. The more they do it, the better they get. So it just cycles out in both directions. So if we can trick them into reading when they don't actually know they're reading, then the reading actually with the book is much simpler and much easier because they kind of did all this extra stuff when they didn't know it was happening. Now this little girl is demonstrating something called the letter runs. She's going backwards. This is the next step. Once they kind of know their letters and sounds, now you want to switch it up and make it mimic more what decoding really is, which is see the letter make the sound, see the letter make the sound, see the letter make the sound. No letter name. Because when kids are reading, they don't go C. C says cat, K, A, A says apple, A. Ah. Those are just interruptions that interfere with getting the word. So what we really want to do is up the ante and see if they can point to the letter and make the sound. If it didn't work, they can switch the sound, but forget the letter name now. So she's doing this, but she's going backward, and that's really important. You don't just want to go backwards. You want to go forward and then backward. You might want to do it long and then short. You might want to do it to a different tune, like Star Spangled Banner or Star Wars. There's no end to the way you can play with it, and it's really no harder any which way.
because text doesn't come in an order, right? When you see a word like cat, it's at, sit, at. That's not an order. So it's not harder to go backward than forward as long as you're looking at the letters and you have something to see as you're going. So I'm just going to play this just so you can kind of see how you can have fun with raising this bar. Now that was the short vowel letter run. If she did the long vowel letter run, it would be a b k d e f g h i j k l m n o p. If she does the short vowel fast version, it's a b a k d e f g h i j k l m n o p. And then if we do it backwards, I can't because I have to have the letters in front of me to do it backwards. We can do it to, uh, to Star Spangled Banner. A b a k d e f. And then you can say switch boys only long h i j k l m. And I did this because there's superhero stuff that you don't know about yet, but. Anyway, there's just no end to how you can play with it. And while all this is happening, oh, one more thing. This little guy got so obsessed with this better alphabet that he wanted to write the lyrics. <laughs> and look what he did. Ignore what the first word looks like, because <laughs> what it actually says is A says A, 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 and by darn it, he got this right number of A's for A, 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 A. Isn't that crazy? But it can also say a a a a a a a a a. Now he knows something you don't, and that is that e y and a y are just too cool, like Fonzie. So they always stick up their thumbs and go a, and that's how he decided to spell a. That's why you see that a y sound. Even though you can tell, like he doesn't know how to spell but yet. He doesn't spell the word also yet, but yet he's wanting to write this. But it can also say. Uh, a, 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 B says B, B, B. Now there he kind of got tired of the Bs and went to C says S, 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 S. But then it looks like he realized he forgot because he went to the D says da, 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 and he realized, hey, I didn't do the C can also say, so he squeezed it in. See it up there? But it can also say S, 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 S. Then he gets to E, F, G says G, 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 I, he gave up on the it can also say. But then he ran out of room, so he just, after J, 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 he just said the end. <laughs> but that was. I mean, that, you can't make a kid do something. It has to be a fire in their belly. These are abstract skills. They're only meaningful to a reader who can use them for an actual purpose. Kids are so many miles away from, even if they know all the individual letters and sounds, from actually being able to really use them for a purpose, that they remain abstract for a really long time until they become something fun that lets them read about their favorite baseball star or their lizard. So the fact that we can get kids this obsessive about letters and sounds means they're not seeing them as abstract letters and sounds. And that's absolutely true because everything I'm going to show you from this point on is happening simultaneously with, oh, and is my clicker going to die? Oh, there, okay. Ignore all this. Don't look. Okay, there. It's going to happen simultaneously with what we're about to look at here, which is the, the real meat. What happens when this doesn't work? Because that happens more often than not. You know, look at... TH. Now, I don't think I mentioned the T, but we tell kids, I mentioned the Y, we tell kids T says turtle, t -t -t. but it doesn't. It doesn't in almost every word they see it in because of words like this and that and those and them and the. So unless the book they pick up is called Tommy and his Turtle Trot to Toronto, they're going to get way more opportunities to see the letter T not saying T than saying T. And yet, it's so easy to give them access. As a matter of fact, can your kids tattle? Like, raise your hand if you have kids that know how to tattle. Like, they could tell us up, who can't do what, who shouldn't be where. OK, it's as easy as tattling. If your kids could tell us up who's not allowed to sit together, then you can give them access to a digraph that's not supposed to be taught until first grade. Because all it is are these two letters. They're not allowed to sit together, ever. They are never allowed to sit together, but they don't listen. So if you pick up any book, look at any page, any line of any book and any page, guess what you see? Side by side, over and over and over again. T and H. And the reason they're not allowed to sit together is they always misbehave, and what they do is they go <sighs> And that's, of course, not appropriate, which is why they're told to stay apart. But they don't listen any better than you two, or you two, or all the other kids in here that I have split up a thousand times. So you're going to see them everywhere. Now, kids don't need to know what a T is or what an H is to look at this and go <sighs> You could show this to your three-year-old nephew. I'm not advising you do it, because there's no purpose. But if you showed it to them, it clearly evokes a behavior that all kids have engaged in. They know why they do it, they know what it's for, and they know the sound that pops out when it happens. 
So that is beginning stages of what we call orthographic mapping. It really is orthographic mapping, just not for the purpose of reading or writing yet. See, the symbol sound pops out. You could also work it backwards, which means, let's say this is on a wall, and you are trying to write the word the, and you need to figure out what letter says so you look at the alphabet and realize quickly none of them say that. But if you look up here, and let's say there are 10 other, 10 other little patterns up here with these little pictures, it's not hard to figure out which one is making the sound that you're trying to find. So now you just copy those letters. The letter names are not a part of this equation or this process. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to have the letter names. I'm saying things can rise like a flood simultaneously. It's not a, a waitress with an appetizer and a salad and a dessert and a steak that all has to be served in an order. Who says that? Why? Why is this a first grade skill? We need this immediately. Half the nation's first sight word that kindergartners are supposed to go home and memorize is the. So much time wasted staring like an actor with a script at a card going, what's this word? What's this word? What's this word? And then next week you get more words and that word's gone and you hope somebody keeps flashing the cards at home because Johnny's going to forget last week's word if he's trying to learn this week's word. How about just giving them the code? like the building block that's in the word, the and this and them and those, now you've knocked out tons of words that alongside those letter sounds, rising like a flood with that better alphabet, are starting to come together and be usable for an actual purpose, which is making sense of what you're already doing all day. Because we're reading and writing all day long at the earliest grade level. The problem is our kids don't have anything to read or write with. They literally don't. And that is, oh, I didn't say one more thing about this. Um, I already mentioned the... Sneaky why, but do you see this little ow? If you've ever told your kids that if they play rough at recess, they're going to get hurt, and you expect them to pay attention to that because you don't want to see kids coming back from recess all beaten up and bruised, kids don't have trouble remembering what happens when they play rough. They don't. They also don't have trouble remembering what they say when they get hurt, which is ow. That happens way before they come to pre-K. And these two letters, these letters, not just two letters, but these letters always play rough. And somebody always gets hurt, just like we know happens. Anytime they get together, O, U, and O, W, they always play rough. Somebody always gets hurt and they go, ow! Now, here's the thing, though. There's a default because we have words like blow. Well, you know, this is great for words like how, now, flower. What about words like blow, flow, um, glow? See that superhero O? He is their favorite superhero ever. You don't really know who the superheroes are yet, but you will in a bit. He is their favorite superhero ever. Anytime he flies by, they will stop dead in their tracks no matter what they're doing and go, oh, 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 because they love him. That's the default. It's built in automatically. If kids try to attack a word like how or glow and they go glow and it doesn't work, next most likely sound right there, ready to pull. So you're kind of just embedding, simplifying, and giving access. Now, the heavy lifting, because kids do have to have a way to keep track of all this, the heavy lifting is what we call the sound wall, a place where kids can go to independently access the sounds they need for reading and the spellings they need for writing. That's the heavy lifting, because what can't they do? Yes, they know how to say ow if they get hurt, but they can't remember which, which of those symbols do that. So that's where they have to have a way to track back, kind of like a bucket of snacks. Kids help themselves, like if they're trying to write the word ow, 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 and they can't remember what letters say ow, you know, they could scan the alphabet train all day long. They're never going to find the letter that says ow because it's not up there. Do you know when they're actually going to get it officially based on most scopes and sequences? And by the way, scopes and sequences are a necessity, a necessity to effective phonics instruction. However, they shouldn't be a pair of handcuffs that shackle a teacher's ability to make sense of what they're doing every single minute of every single day, starting at the very beginning of pre-K and kindergarten because otherwise they're just dancing around to no purpose. So your scope and sequence is ideal because it makes sure everybody's at least here. <laughs> and that's your kind of your, like a, I don't call it a safety net necessarily, but it's your absolute must be here by this point at least, but gosh, take those opportunities every chance you get to give more because your scope and sequence is your program. What I'm talking about today is not a program. It's a teacher skill set of expertise that's in her gut or his gut so that if your program comes and goes every three years, which it, it ultimately will, that teacher could be locked in a room with the back of a magazine and a pencil and a kid and get that kid reading. And the program's just a perk. That's just the great playground that gives her more ways to play with these muscles that are this skill ability, this skill set, this way to make things make sense. Now, the sound wall, though, that I mentioned, the key part is kids do have to have a way to keep track of it all. They don't have to use their working memory to keep 
connected the sound symbol relationships, that's going to be on the sound wall. What they do have to do is just come to that sound wall and apply what they already know to make sense of what they've got and what they need to read or to write words. So if they need the owl sound for the word how, they just look up here and it's pretty clear, I mean there's only two right now, pretty clear which one they would need. As to which one they write, they just pick one. We'll talk about how that choice gets fine-tuned for spelling as we move on. But this is really a, a game changer because I think I mentioned, I asked you the question but I didn't answer it. I said, do you know when that owl sound is taught? Do you know it's taught in second grade in most scopes and sequences? Second grade. If poor little Howard wants to write about his mouse in kindergarten, his mouse will be dead by the time he gets the owl sound he needs to do it. How sad is that? That he's got to wait because someone somewhere said he can't have the owl sound. And how's he supposed to read his own name? Think about just writing his name. It's an exercise in rote memorization. He has to write H-A-W-A A-R-A-D-A because he's got two phonics skills in his name and neither one is he allowed to learn until second grade. So he's writing letters he doesn't hear for sounds he doesn't know and yet he's got to do this every day. It's such a perfect opportunity to give him what he needs to not just make sense of his name, but what about the word how? Every kindergartner's got to read the word how and now and about all the kids, not just Howard, they need the owl, and they need it now. <laughs> That's so cool that that rhymes. <laughs> they need the owl, and they need it now. I'm going to have to really make a mental note to remember that one. Um, it just, and it's so easy. If they know what they say when they get hurt, that's it. It's that easy. Why would we wait? Like, why would we wait? And the neat part is whatever the program is that has the scope and sequence, I guarantee you're going to find the word now in it, and you're going to find the word the in it, too in whatever stories the kids are reading, in whatever activities they're writing. So they're gonna get so much more value out of every minute of the day that they're working with that program or their playground. I call the program the playground because it's the designated spot you're supposed to be engaging in all this reading and writing play. It's gonna give you the, the stuff that you need to really build up this, this ownership that kids have. But what it's not gonna give you is a way to make the code make sense. That's gonna rely on repetitious skill-based practice and only on the skills at the scope and sequence, not on the actual skills that are needed to read the words that are part of the program, because that's just kind of a, ca a, a casual, what do they call, a casualty, uh, there's a word, can't think of it, but that's just part of what we have to accept is that what we're reading in our program will have to have words in it that have phonic skills that we're not gonna teach until another year or another two years, and, and it, we don't have to accept that. We don't have to accept that at all, because the teacher's the teacher, the program is her tool. The program isn't the teacher, the teacher's the teacher. And the teacher has so much power, um, especially with a good program, but even if you're stuck with not the best program, the teacher still has the power to make a change that's huge. Now, I want to really show you what it feels like to be a kid who's being divvied out these pieces of the code across traditionally three to four grade level years. That's a long time to wait for the whole code that you need to read and to write every single day. But to really feel their pain, if we had time and we were in a smaller room, I would do this for real. Right now, I'm just going to show you a video clip of it with teachers around the country doing it. If somebody told you to draw an outline of a brain, and that's representing your brain. Now, inside that brain, I want you to write 10 letters, any 10 letters you want. So you would write, you know, K, R, T, S, whatever. Once you get your 10 letters, pick five sight words, any five sight words you like. Stick them in the brain. The, of, want, whatever it is. Now, that's what you know. So that, you're a high kindergartner if you know that. That's great. Or if you're an ELL learner that just came over learning English and you know those letter sounds and you know those five sight words, you're doing great. So here's what we're going to do. What I want you to do is simply draw a picture of your favorite animal. You can see there's a little dog up there. And then write what your favorite animal is and tell me why you like it so much. But you're only allowed to use those ten letters and five sight words that are in your brain. Nothing else, because if you don't know it, how could you use it, right? So you're like a kid now. This is what you've got. What can you do with it? And keep in mind, you've got a lot more than most of the kids will in Kinder for at least half the year. That's a lot of days, a lot of hours, a lot of months, and this is what you've got. So let's watch and see what teachers do to get around what they don't have that they need to engage all day long. What's the first grade word y'all are doing? I think it's okay. Okay. Okay, the next part. Now, does everybody have their five side words? Yeah. Yes. Now, outside of your brain, draw a picture of your favorite animal, but it has to be a group 
Group outside decision as to what your favorite answer is. Yeah. So you've got your five sight words, you've got your ten letters, they're inside of your brain, so that's the stuff you know, which is a lot, so congratulations, because if we hear kinder, you're at the head of the pack, or that's under your belt already. You've got a picture of an animal that you love the most, that you're so excited about. So now what you're going to do is, using only those ten letters and five sight words, you're going to tell me what your animal is, and why you like it. Now you have to use that as an I see one group trying to change their animal. Can't change your animal. If you've got a dog, keep your dog. Don't turn him into a king. You're trying to use our imagination. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> okay, D. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, is that a mouse? Oh, no. It's a nice to be a dog. Oh, I like his ears, though. Okay, well, if you had some flexibility there, you could have gone either way, and I would have done it. So what are you guys trying rat. to figure out? I think a rat. Oh, but that's not a rat, that's a cat, right? <laughs> See, are you cheating already? That's why we had that outside done. here. Are you trying to change your cat into a rat because you could spell rat easier? Yes, I saw a rat. <laughs> I just like the way your face looks right now as, you're, as you're, your eyes are rolling all over your, your like, so you're going to see something that's not already there the 18th time they roll over those letters. <laughs> <laughs> this spot rum to me. He brings rum to you. Wow. <laughs> Got him well trained. <laughs> Is that a college trick he picked up? Is that what he keeps in that little? <laughs> now, I love that. What would go at the very end of that? A period. A period. Very good. And then I'm going to ask you to uh, tell me what spot is. Can you tell me what kind of an animal he is? Not using newsletters. <laughs> you mean you don't know how to write? What, well, tell me first about what is he? A dog. A dog. So do you know how to spell the word dog? Like, and keep in mind, that's what you know. Nope. Nope, you don't. Can you try? Sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> how? <laughs> B-O-V. Be, oh, oh, that's very good, actually, because that's really close. Because I've got the ah sound that I need. It's just the duh, duh, duh sound. Do you remember that letter that makes that sound? It's so tricky. And I know it's not in your brain. D, d, that would be a D. That would be the first one. So if you put a D-O, and we'll talk about the letter that you need at the end in just a bit. Me like the dog. Me like the dog. That works. That's creative. Yeah, that's a good way to get around that. Is it because you don't have an eye? Yeah, we don't have an eye. But me likes dog. That would be a good option. And why do you like the dog? Because you also have to tell me why you like the dog. The dog is dead. <laughs> do you have letters to make? You do have letters to make dead. Okay, that would work. I guess that would be sad, and I'll refer you to the counselor, but I guess you could do that. The dog is dead. Said, me like the dog, the dog is dead. The dog is lost. Well, you know what? Just just do what you can. Just write what you can. And that poor lady had, she had like a dog or a pig or a cat, and she had none of the letters at all that were, none of the letters that were in her her words, so she just, she had the world's worst letters. Like she picked Q and Z and awful letters. She couldn't go anywhere. She just spent the whole time like a kid, not, I don't know what to write, is what truly her situation was. And when we say something like, you know, oh, that's okay, just sound it out. Just do your best, sound it out. If a kid could talk like an adult, they'd be like, with what? <laughs> what do you propose I sound this out with? Excuse me, but the scope and sequence hasn't even introduced the sound that I need to write about this animal, let alone the things that I'd like to share with you that I know about this animal. And not only that, we're doing a letter a week. It's week five. I've got five letters. This is not, this is an impossible task. Every day you tell us we're supposed to write about something. With what? <laughs> we don't have anything to write with. That's gotta be how they feel. But they don't say that. What they just say is, I don't know what to write. And now some kids do know what to write. And they're like the one who had the dog that brought rum to her. <laughs> because she was actually so advanced. She brought so much to the table, I was able to add a little more to it. I could see exactly what she needed. We could pinpoint that. We could talk about punctuation. So in that little 10-minute period, some kids got a lot. 
They brought enough to the table to take extra value away because I saw where they were. I could give them the next piece. So when they left, they had a little more than they had when they started. But for the kids who brought nothing, they left with nothing. Because if you come to the table without any tools, you can't do anything at the table. So you leave the table without any tools. And the whole point was you're basically just getting exposure. But exposure is not experience. Experience is a great teacher. Exposure is like being stuck at the ER all night because somebody had to get stitches. Like you're not getting the same training the medical doctors are. They love being at the ER all night. They fine tune what only the textbooks began to tell them and now they're getting to see it all in real time. But they have enough knowledge to make sense of what they're seeing so that it's honing and fine tuning and extending those pieces of knowledge they already have. We're in an ER, we don't even know what we're looking at. So we leave the ER, we haven't learned a thing except that we don't like to be stuck at the ER. And that's how it can feel when you look at how, much, how many hours are spent with kids reading and writing all day long, but are they really reading and writing all day long or are they just looking at a bunch of words while the teacher talks about a bunch of words? Like there's so much value to be harvested there, but it's all based on what they bring to the table to make sense of it. So I look at what we're gonna talk about as the glasses. The ways to, to you don't, they're not something that you're looking at. It's not the stuff you're reading. It's a way to make sense of whatever it is you are reading, whatever your program is giving you, whatever your district has kids doing, your math problems, your lunch choices, your name, like any text. Text is everywhere. Do kids have their glasses? Do they have lenses through which they can view that to make sense of it? Or are they like us, if you're 40 or older, where all of a sudden you can't see, you used to be able to see, but now you can't see up close. Like you can see great far away, but up close you look at words and they're just a blur. What's the point? Like why would I look at a bunch of words I can't even make sense of? I have to have my glasses on or I'm wasting my time staring at the words. I try, I keep thinking I can will my eyes to see better now like they used to, doesn't work. I have to have those lenses to actually make sense of and merit even bothering to look at the words. So look at everything we're gonna see from this point forward is just glasses that kids can have on all day, all day long, as text is being encountered, being played with. There's no reason we have to wait. This is a little girl in TK, and she wrote about her vocation house. Now she built that. She literally built that. She doesn't have all of the code, but she had some blocks, and she could put those blocks together to build something and take them apart and build something else. I guarantee you a vacation house is not gonna be on your word wall if you teach in kinder. We rely on our word wall in kinder or first typically, or if you teach an upper grade where kids can't read or spell well, they look at these words. Words are just like a fake building block. It's like 20 building blocks pre-glued together into a bridge. Plopping that down on your block tower doesn't actually build your capability as a block builder or a strategic um, construction artist. We want kids to actually have the tools to build anything, take it apart and build something else. Reading is really, um, the easiest way to see into the skill set of a reader is their writing. Writing is a window into the mind of a reader. So what they can build, that's what's in their skill set to attack text with. So when she wrote my, now she knows sneaky why, that's how she got the I sound for my. Then she put vocation. She doesn't know yet the A-T-I-O-N, T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N phonics secret. She doesn't know that yet, but that's okay. She could build it a different way using what she did have. And those pieces that she used to build it, imagine how many words she can read if she has the sh sound, if she has the a sound, if she has the uh sound, for short you, the k sound. And then for house, yes, she spelled it wrong, but how cool that she could put that down. Does she have the text experience yet to fine tune the spelling, to know that house should be O-U, flower should be O-W? No, she's four. <laughs> she doesn't, but guess what? She will, guaranteed. You know how we know? Because she can write that. If she can write that, that means she knows the ow connection, which means if she sees the word how, she could read that. And reading is the best teacher. Research shows that if you have 100 IQ, which is dead average, and you are able to actually read a word, so it's not see it, but read it, it takes approximately three experiences with that word, actually reading it, to form a visual picture of the word. Now, it's not fail-proof. It just means you have some awareness of what looks right. Now, if you see a word, but you can't read it, there's nothing that we don't know anything. There's no research that says how many times you'd have to see a word to magically know how it's spelled. But we know that reading is the best fine tuner of spelling. It does the bulk of the labor, so there's much less manual labor left over for you to have to play with. So the goal is get them reading, get them reading, get them reading, because reading is gonna do so much of the work for us when it comes to spelling. And from a reading perspective, we can identify that she could read any of those words with the owl sound. She just doesn't yet have the next step under her belt as a speller to know which one is actually right for which word. But because we know she can read it, we know she will, which means this step is gonna be happening and coming on board naturally, and that's what we want. Oh, I forgot this one. This was really cute too. 
not only is Vacation House not going to be on your word wall, but this is a kindergarten story, a fairy tale setting. And this little guy wrote here, if you look fourth line up from the bottom, the ghost almost kissed her, but the dad said, in quotes, get your hands off my wife. <laughs> then the ghost flew away and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> now, that's not going to be on your word wall, right? But he wanted to add that to his story, and so much so that he actually used exclamation points and quotation marks. I mean, he doesn't know how to write the S not backwards, but yet look what he can do. We just get this shift in things that are easy looking hard and things that are supposed to be hard actually being easy. And that's so powerful. I mean, the time spent dedicated to a writing activity is so much more valued when kids can actually write. And everything he is writing is exposing like an x-ray his skill set as a reader. You can see in there what he could do as a reader and fan that out into all of how he would um, puzzle out words using what you see him doing with these building blocks he has. Even though he can't spell the word they. Look how many times he tries. <laughs> you know, T-H-E-A-Y, T-H-E-A-Y. He's not copying words. There are no words to copy. He's building as he goes. Now, obviously, that's a great point for me as a teacher to come in and focus on and say, hey, I noticed you spelled they like this. And somebody, I think, did, because you can see on the very last line, he finally dropped the A, and he made it an E. So somewhere along the line, he changed his mind. Now, how does this look? Well, it looks like this. If you are, and I'm using, by the way, just so you know, I'm using the lowest level zero-based knowledge learner, which I like to call kinder. I've taught the different grades, but to me, a whole is a whole is a whole. If you're a fourth grader and you're missing giant pieces of the code, you are basically rendered helpless to crack unfamiliar text. If you're in kindergartner, same situation, it's just you are absolutely at the bottom of the barrel in terms of all readiness capability, working memory, cognitive memory, auditory processing, speech and articulation. So they're kind of a great little place to look at and compare to our upper grade struggling learners because our upper grade struggling readers often have the same deficits that a kindergarten that has by default just because of developmental readiness, not having activated those systems for learning yet. So when I say, kinder or first, I want you to still picture your struggling fourth grader. We're going to kind of bring it up to those higher levels as well. You'll see on the group folks working with adults. So the code doesn't change, just the text level. But just keep that in mind, because I like to look at learners who know nothing so you can compare it to your learners who know something. Um, if you're in kindergarten and you've just done your whatever alphabet song you normally would do, you probably sing something along the lines of A says a a apple which is a real problem if your school starts in August, because now you're faced with an opportunity to put your money where your mouth is and use that letter and that sound that you've been working to teach every day. So there it is. It's right there in our calendar, guys. Let's read it. Let's read this word. It's got an A in it, just like on our, on our alphabet train. Ready? August. Well, that didn't work, because the A didn't do what it was supposed to do. It actually made not just the wrong sound. It made the sound of a whole other letter that's not even up there which is really weird, and I skipped the U altogether. I just ignored it and pretended it wasn't there. Now, how is that connecting with what this letter situation is supposed to be when we're singing A says apple, ah, 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 but it can also say acorn, a, 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 you know, or whatever song you might sing. There, the brain is a pattern-making machine. It's got to be able to make sense of what it sees or it's going to toss it. It's a use it or lose it system. So this is going to be a real problem if every day for 30 days I have to basically teach this and then contradict it like this. Like I'd almost be better off not doing either one and just calling it a day. Because <laughs> if I tell the brain it's A is going to say this and then I tell the brain A is going to say that, the brain leaves going one to one, still don't have a clue what it does. Like this just canceled out that. And this happens all the time with text because letters always come together. They're like kids. They behave great when they're by themselves <laughs> on the alphabet train. Like they can't get a hold of each other. But as soon as letters get together with other letters, they're like little kids that get together on the floor. All bets are off and different behaviors come out. And those are what we're dealing with all day, our words, not individual letters. So this is a real problem. The earlier the grade level, the more this happens to you. And you probably don't even notice that anymore because kids don't ask you anymore. Well, they've never asked, probably. If you're in an upper grade and you work with ELL, they do ask because it doesn't make sense. So they will typically ask you until they realize it never makes sense and then they stop asking because that becomes the norm. The pattern becomes the opposite of what they expect. But there's a secret. There's a reason that that A isn't making the sound you'd expect. The problem is it's a grown-up secret. It's a grown-up reading and writing secret and it's big because it's a grown-up size secret. So if I tell you a grown-up secret before your brain's ready, your brain could explode. 
Oh, by the way, if you do teach early grades, K-1, be careful because you'll set your criers off, especially if it's August. So be careful. But it, but it is a significant motivational factor because what it does is it sets the stage for I've got it, you want it, I'll decide if you can have it, but this one's big. Like I've never, told, I've never even told my third grade class this secret. So now, instead of just talking about letter sounds, you're talking about something that's causing all the kids to look at you like this. Like they can't wait to hear what you're about to say about this letter. It completely shifts where this lives in their brain. Secrets make things important to kids. We have to trigger a need to know if we want to save our breath and not say it 14 times. If you can listen with a need to know, it puts a catcher's mitt in place in the brain. It primes the brain to actually receive that information in a different way than when you just toss out a ball that nobody's expecting, nobody cares, and nobody wants. So you want to make sure someone's there to catch it. And the problem is intellectual curiosity only works for kids who know enough to know something's not right. But what about the kids who don't know a letter from a number from a squirrel? They don't even know what you're talking about. You could have told them that word was zebra. They'd be like, OK, I don't care, <laughs> whatever. So how do you trigger a need to know in a kid who doesn't know enough to know there's something he needs to know? You have to go with what they do know. Secrets. Everybody wants to know a secret. Doesn't matter what it's about. So now you've got their attention. Now they've got a need to know. Now this is important. This is what marks the information for memory and prioritize learning in the brain. So triggering the need to know. There are different ways to trigger it, and I'll show you a couple other ways to do this, but secrets are just, a, they're just an easy in. And I see this conversation in the group, the Facebook group a lot, where people say, like, oh, I don't really like to use secrets. These are grown-up reading and writing secrets, which means you're supposed to tell grown-ups. Grown-ups can hear them. It's kids you've got to be careful of, because their brain may not be big enough. And if their brain's not big enough, their brain could explode. <laughs> so you only can tell parents, but you want to tell your parents, because they are going to be so excited that you actually know these great big reading secrets. But if you decide to just go with silly reasons or super whatever, that doesn't hold the same neurological weight. I mean, you want to get every bang for the buck you can. Secrets make things important to kids. Mary Helen Mordino Yang is actually a Harvard neuroscience and the whole neuroscientist. Um, she was trained at Harvard. I think she's on Ber at Berkeley now or US USC, UCF. But anyway, her whole scope of work is it's neurobiologically impossible for kids to think deeply about things they don't care about. So we've got to find a hook. And it's hard to do that with these completely abstract content areas, like phonics, or even like math. And math's actually much less abstract if you're looking at early grade math, because you can bring cookies to represent 5 minus 3. You can eat the cookies. I mean, you can bring it to life. But it's really hard to bring sound symbol relationships to life for a kid who isn't even anywhere near actually using them to read or write yet. So this is key. The harder the content, the more important it is to find that emotional connection. This teacher does a great job of that, so I'm just going to play it. To fourth graders? To fourth graders? Oh my. To third graders? Don't know the secrets. Don't know the secrets. What? Oh, oh, right. right. The second graders don't know the secrets. Oh my gosh! Oh. The first graders don't know the secrets. Oh. You were the first kindergartners to. You'd never guess she's about to teach a phonics lesson. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? How amazing is that when you can t make something what it's not? Because now it is. And it's just, and this is the beauty of the brain and the brain plasticity is nothing is set in stone when it comes to how these connections in our brain live. We can, the, the brain can rewire itself based on experiences and we can formulate those experiences to prompt those reconnections in different ways. That's when kids get so obsessive about letter sounds, they want to write the lyrics to the Better Alphabet song. <laughs> Again, that's such, an un, that's such an impossible thing to expect anybody would want to write lyrics to a song that has no lyrics. It's just A says, ah, 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 ah. especially a kid who has to work that hard to write. He's only been doing it for like, probably, he's only been on earth for five, four years, so now he's got to sit there and control his little fine motor skill. I mean, he had to put a lot of effort into being able to do that. It had to be important to him. And it shouldn't be important to him. It's not even important to us. They're just a means to an end. Letters and sounds are just a means to an end to do the fun stuff, which is reading and writing. But that's a long way away for these little ones. So how do we get them to be that motivated for something they don't even understand what it's for? And it's the opposite of what they do. They're concrete thinkers. And if you've got struggling fourth or fifth or sixth graders, who struggle with reading, they too are not ideally equipped to handle these abstract concepts because that involves things that might be part of their, their deficit, working memory, visual processing. A lot of times there's an auditory issue happening almost, almost every time you've got a real struggling reader. There's something happening with the language and the auditory processing. So all of these things are not on the 
pathway to capturing information when it's got a different meaning to it than just letter sound skills. And I'll tell you what the secret is right now so you know what I'm talking about. There are two letters in this word August that are in love. In love, like huge crush on each other. Not a little in love, like big time. They just, they're probably gonna get married any day. They're AU, but it's actually not just A and U that are in love, A and W are in love too. They're just not in this word, but I might as well scoop it all out and tell you because I'm sure in five seconds we're gonna see a word that's got AW in it too. So I'm just gonna tell you, these guys are head over heels in love and anytime they get together, they get so embarrassed that they always put their heads down and they go, I bet you know, ah, that's right, that's the sound they make. Like in the word August or awful or saw or awesome or your name, Austin, look at all these words that have this grown up secret in it. Now if you didn't know the secret, you wouldn't be able to read the word. You'd think that word's August. You'd think this word's awful. You might call him Austin. So it's a good thing you know this secret. Now you'll get a thousand and one opportunities to play with this across the day, not even by trying. You'll just see words and your kids will see words. So whether you notice or they notice, they'll be going, I see a secret in that word. I see a secret in that word. Even on the lunch menu, spaghetti, ah. So, so it just, it keeps you honest. It keeps you credible and it gives the brain a way to pattern out why what's supposed to happen isn't. That's just so important because you need credibility when you tell them what A is supposed to do. You're not wrong. A does say A and it does say A. But remember, these guys are in love. That's why. It's like saying Johnny behaves beautifully. He just can't sit with Sam because <laughs> everybody knows when Johnny and Sam get together, they always bicker and somebody always you know, gets in trouble. So it's those kinds of if not then this, if not that then this, if all else fails, here's what happens. It's this patterning out system that is the brain system for learning. It's harder to teach T if they don't know about TH. So it seems counterintuitive, but it's not harder to teach TH, it's easier. It's easier to teach T says T if they know why it doesn't. Because now whenever T does say T, they understand here's why. But when it's not, it's because of this. It's much harder to withhold all the information and then send them loose throughout the day to do the job of a kinder or a first or a second grader and expect any of that to actually hold value. It just makes us kind of run around in a lot of circles and not get anywhere, even though we're exhausted. Um, and, and it's not just early grade words. Hydraulic is a word that a lot of upper grade kids might not be able to read. You've got a sneaky Y in there and you've got the AU in there. So it's such a simple, it's, it's simple building blocks in a complex word. But the same simple connection that lets a five-year-old go, oh, and then start using it, is exactly what a fourth grader can have to go, oh, and then start using it. And that can happen in math. It can happen in science. It doesn't have to impede the momentum of on-grade level instruction where you have to divert to a phonics lesson because you've got a kid who reads at a first grade level. That's not realistic. Upper grade teachers, they've got a lot on their plate. They are not masters of the code, nor do they want to be. But they can keep track of common sense connections and they can lay out a bucket of snacks and say, hey, help yourself, guys, here it is. Get what you need whenever you need it. I've added it to the bucket. Like that's the goal is in the moment across the entire instructional day. Like there's never a time you're going to be doing this because you're going to do it all the time. I don't put my glasses on from 9.15 to 9.30 in my little glasses block. I wear my glasses whenever I've got to actually work with text because I can't see it. I can't make sense of it without my glasses. So this is a never ending thing. It spins through your entire day. It's the way kids make sense of the words, of the sounds that they maybe haven't been formally taught yet in the scope and sequence, but they need it early and they need it fast and they need as much as they can have. And as long as they're not skills, they're just things they already know. Schemas that are already locked in before they come into school. The working memory can hold four pieces of information. If it's doing a, a good job. Mine I don't think holds more than two at a time and sometimes I swear as soon as I think of one thing and then the next thought comes in, the first thing's gone. So I think I've even got like less than two cylinder capacity. But the beauty is if you think in schemas, schemas hold infinite amounts of information. A schema is like what happened last year at your family Thanksgiving. All the behaviors, all of the incidents, all of the sequential events, you can store so much information when it's connected in a way that is, it's like a story base. You're thinking in a story, recalling a time and everything that goes along with that. And there's an infinite amount of information that can be stored in a schema. So if we can trigger the recall of those schemas and we can intentionally organize information into what we know kids have in their schema, which again, five years on earth, you don't have a lot to work with. 
but there's certain common denominators, and those are our feelings. Things that we feel, behaviors that we have, social interactions and how that plays out. Those are things that we all share. Being in love, um, not getting along, playing rough and getting hurt, being sneaky, all of these little things that we already understand, that's what we can tie these phonic skills to and just make it so much easier. Um, Novelty is another way to trigger need to know. So when I mention secret, that's one way. Another way is when you heard me go, ah. That woke up some of my kids in my class who maybe otherwise were eating their shoe. Because any kind of a pitch or rhythm shift or vocal inflection or extreme body gesture is going to trigger the brain to have a need to know. What's she doing? What's going on? And a great example of this is I was doing a workshop. It was a, a professional development in a district where I was working with all of pre-K to five, but I had early grades in the morning, upper grade afternoon, upper grades afternoon, it was in the summer, and one of the upper grade teachers brought her daughter, I guess she didn't have a babysitter, but her daughter was beautifully behaved, she sat in the back the whole time, played on her mom's phone. She had just turned four, I believe, or I think it was four, not five, and so just beautifully behaved. She's playing on her phone, never bothered to look up except one time, and that was when, by accident, she, heard something novel. It triggered a need to know. And what it was, was me going, ah, because I had my hands like this, and I was like wiggling, and I was just kind of acting this out, ah. And she looked up at me, and she went like this. She went. And then she got out of her seat a little bit to see, like, because she was trying to look at all of me. And I'm sure her need to know was, is she having a stroke? Is the ambulance going to come? Is that lady crazy? Like, she was just trying to make sense of, like, what's going on? That's a weird sound, and why is she doing this? It just came out of the blue. Now, she only gave me about four and a half, five seconds of this heightened, focused attention, and then she just totally lost interest, went right back to playing on her mom's phone. So maybe another 30 minutes went by, and we took a break. After the break, I went up to this little girl and said, could you tell me what these letters say? And her mom said, she's just turned four. She doesn't, she doesn't start kindergarten for She's a late birthday. She doesn't know any letters yet. So this is just an experiment. I said, could you tell me what these letters say? And the little girl went, she went, ah. Now, she wasn't thinking lip position, tongue position, mouth shape, vowel sound. She wasn't thinking about vowel teams. It was a feeling. It was just a feeling connected with a visual that prompted a sound. And the sound just happened to be perfectly hooked into what we need, which is this A-U-A-W or short O sound. What triggered it was this visual. She doesn't even have to know what a letter is to be able to see this and have that evoke a feeling which then prompts the sound. Now we took another, now by the way, she's, that's just the precursor step. It's not like, oh, she's ready to read. No, she's not ready to read, but isn't it interesting how we can do that I wasn't trying to teach it, she wasn't trying to learn. She just looked up at the perfectly wrong or right time, however you want to look at it. And she didn't do it accidentally, she did it because the brain perceived novelty, she had a need to know in that four seconds. And it wasn't just a general need to know, it was a heightened state of alert. Because when you have a need to know, you're invested. You want to figure out what's going on. Once you've accounted for it, now you're not interested again, necessarily, unless you are interested because you're an adult. But she wasn't, so she backed out. But that was a heightened, concentrated time of absorption during that three or four seconds she gave me. So it's interesting that that could happen so fast when we've got upper grade teachers working daily in resource classrooms trying to teach these phonics skills and those kids are not getting it. And she's four and she's not even trying to do it and doesn't even know what a letter is. And now it's stuck in her head and she can't get rid of it if she wants to. Until later. Now if she doesn't use it, she'll lose it. It's a precursor. So it's not that she's ready to decode, but that's what she'd need to decode. She'd need to be able to see the symbol and have the sound pop out. To write it or to encode, she'd have to hear the sound and know who the culprit is that makes it. And that's what we did after the next break. After the break, I put 10 of these on a chalk tray and I went up to the same little girl and said, could you go point to the letters that go, ah, and she was able to immediately identify the culprit. She didn't get it confused with the digraph TH or the other vowel pair or um, diphthong, which is O-U-O-W, not because she knows what any of those letters are, but because this is the one that's in love. So that's what a writer would have to do. Hear the sound I'm making to write the word s ah, s ah, and then identify the options to spell it. So the heavy lifting, the part they don't already know is what the sound wall would hold. But what the sound wall doesn't need to hold is why and how and what, because that's already a given. That's already what they know. But I love that example because it's such a, it was such an interesting thing to see. If she had been in my classroom, we'd play with that all day long. 
Like, I would have tossed that key out, and we'd be unlocking things everywhere. We'd be looking at the book called Alexander and the Terrible, Awful, Horrible, No Good Day. I mean, we would be looking for opportunities to play with this key to unlock words all around us. But I don't know what's going to happen to her. She's probably, well, her mom's a teacher, maybe. I don't know, maybe they did use it. Maybe there was a calendar on the fridge, and the word was August. Maybe she took a pink crayon and drew a heart around the AU on the calendar and said, Mommy, look, the letters that love each other are on our refrigerator, see? Like, I don't know. But I know in a classroom, I'll have ample opportunities to use it, and I won't have to go out of my way at all. You could give me any page of any program at all, I guarantee you I could find an opportunity to use that building block, as well as the TH, as well as the OW. Like, it doesn't matter. Pick your poison. Any word will work. <laughs> there's so many words, and there's only this finite number of building blocks. So you're really just giving what's the most bang for the buck, and then just letting it play all day, all week, all month. And the way this works, the reason this works, is really rooted in early brain development. And this is where science of reading needs to, and I say science of reading like it's a thing. It's not. It's a body of knowledge, the body of research that we're now paying attention to that really focuses on what is important when kids are learning how to read. But there's another layer to what's important when kids are learning anything, and that's how we learn. The brain system for learning, not just phonics, but how we actually learn in general. Things have to be meaningful. There have to be connections made. And the more connections you have to something, the less your working memory has to be taxed to try to recall it, which is important for reading and writing. Because reading and writing isn't about the phonics pattern. It's about what, what is the story I want to tell? Or why is this character um, taking her dog to the mountaintop making me cry? It's about what happens when you apply this as a bridge to actually read and write, which means your, your comprehension has to be freed up to process. You can't be focused on letters and sounds when you're actually reading to learn. So the less we have to focus on the thinking about the, the mechanics, the, the more able we're able to, to, to read and write, which is the focus of learning in three, three, four, or five. You know, we learn to read in K-1-2 so we can read to learn in three, four, five. Ideally, though, we're, we're reading to learn all the way through. But we want to automate these processes as quickly and as early as we can. And the best way to do that is to focus on the brain science that shows us how kids actually learn best. Brain development is a key feature with this, because early brain development is back to front, and the earlier developing areas of the brain are the ones we're targeting. We are not spinning our wheels targeting this higher level executive processing center because we know that with developmental readiness at the early grades, or processing delays among struggling readers at the upper grades, or language deficits among ELL learners at any grades, these are blocked doors. Like, they're not the easiest doorway to go through. If you're looking for a common denominator that's most likely to resonate with all kids, it's not the higher level executive processing centers. It's just not. Even the kids who have total functionality of those centers still are going to enjoy when you can make it totally easy and connect it to something they already know. Now they just get to go further even faster. So we all are better in a pool where we're swimming with the current, pushing behind us instead of against it. And if we look at early brain development and we pay attention to what areas are early or developing, and then we target our instruction to hit those areas, we just get more bang for our buck with those kids at the grade levels where this is supposed to be taught or catching up those kids who missed it at those upper grade levels. Um, so here's what we're actually aiming for. When we say that those letters are in love and they have a crush on each other, we're going with feeling embarrassed and attending to social feedback. Because one of the reasons you feel embarrassed is everybody's watching you after maybe the music class where you had to square dance and hold hands with the little girl and fourth grade boys and fourth grade girls don't like to have to sashay down the aisle together. And when they come back to the classroom and the kids tease them about who had to hold hands with who and their face turns beet red, those are familiar feelings. And you don't forget what you feel. You forget what you learn, but you can't forget what you feel. So tapping into these heavy anchors that are already there, things, the skills don't go anywhere when you can root them down there. So that's the area that we're targeting with that sound skill. And those are the areas that have nothing at all to do with working memory, cognitive processing, auditory processing, articulation capability. We're not, we're not going through those landmines. Those are landmines that a lot of kids get caught up in the weeds with, and you can't get through those landmines. Johnny, you're going, ah, ah, Johnny, can you watch my mouth? You need to make your mouth look like mine. Ah, ah, and Johnny's going, ah, ah, ah. And you're like, no, that's the ah, ah. I want, I want ah, ah, like in hot. You're giving me hot. You're, you're targeting his auditory processing. Or you're targeting, if he doesn't speak language, English, you're targeting sounds in a, in a language that isn't his, so they're not familiar. Totally different when you stick your tongue out at him and go 
Even kids who don't know how to make that sound, so that's a tricky sound speech-wise. A lot of kids want to go, because that's what they hear when they use their auditory angle. But you know what they don't do when their brother's being bratty? They don't go, they go, the tongue always comes out when the goal of the game is to make your little brother know he's being bratty. The tongue may or may not come out when the goal of the game is to make a sound that I think I hear my teacher making, but that I can't really discern well enough to know how to articulate it myself. So you're just taking a different path that doesn't hit these landmines, which means you're, you're not having to um, be delayed by, by waiting for readiness in whatever capacity. You can get straight in. Now, will those kids still have delays in applying these, these skills, these tools? Of, of course. But they're, they're ahead now. So they have time to spend a little longer on the comprehension, to really back up a little bit and work on, now, what do we do with this skill that we have? Let's blend it. Blending is still going to be tricky for a kid that has auditory delays, but at least he now can pull instantly with automation what he needs to blend with. Imagine getting stuck where you can't even remember the sound, you don't recognize the symbol, then once you figure it out, now you've got to try to figure out how to blend the sounds together, but half your brain's over here trying to figure out the next sound symbol relationship. All the while, you now have to figure out what the sentence is about or the meaning of it in the story. It's like an impossible task. So the more we can remove from their working memory and the faster we can get this in, the more all these pieces work together to actually give us some juice for our day. Um, and it's just all about this brain development and what areas are our in and the brain plasticity, how we can use these malleable connections to restructure the way we want kids to process these sound symbol code relationships. These teachers, imagine watching this video instead of doing workbook page 47 on our controlled vowels in your second grade textbook, because usually this phonic seal comes either in second grade beginning of the year or first grade end of year. ER, IR, and UR love to go riding in cars, but they are terrible, awful, horrible, no good drivers. They don't even have driver's licenses, and they always have to slam on the brakes and say, Now, I love that you laughed, because my workbook, page 47, would not have made you laugh. Not even a little. And it's not just about multi-sensory, see it, say it, do it. It's about feel it. Feel it's the most important of all. And you can't forget what you feel. So if you can tap all of those buttons as you're feeding this information in, then it's got a lot of, of, of pathways to be retrieved easily, effortlessly. Every kid's been in a car. We all know what it feels like when it stops fast. Now, it's not like they have to tell the story exactly the way the teacher did, because this little girl is in her third day of kindergarten. Her mom was at a workshop just like this. It was a state-wide required workshop for um, teachers in schools that needed to make improvement. And I got one day there. And my day, we were doing what we're doing here, but instead of in an hour, we had the day. And the mom went home the first week of school. This was the weekend before school started. She was at the dinner table. She just told her husband like the things they did each day. And I guess on my day, she must have used an example like the er sound. Her daughter's going into kindergarten, her daughter's in the third day of kindergarten when this was videoed, and she has a sister who's in pre-K. And the mom was doing the dishes with the dad, and they heard all this noise in the other room, and this is what they saw. And they actually videoed it, and then she tweeted it and tagged me, which is the only reason I got to see this. This little girl can take those teachers' jobs. She is so good at teaching a skill that she's not supposed to have for another two years. Hi, kids. Do you want to know about the secrets about these? So, E-R, I-R, U-R. When they get together, they hop in their cars, they drive crazy, and they say, Yeah. So, what they do, driving their cars crazy. But when you grow up, you don't do that. Okay? She made that all her own. I mean, she even added a public service announcement at the end of that. Did you hear that? Like, that is nothing to do. But that's great. Like, that is better than the way the teachers told it. That, it's not going anywhere. That is stuck like glue to everything she's ever known about cars and when they stop fast, how it feels. It's not workbook page 27 that's going to disappear next week when I talk about OR, or the following week when I talk about AR, or then the next month when we have to mix them all up and put them together on a test, and we just hope they've kept track of everything. And everything that they get, they start using. So let's say she knows the H sound, which I don't know if she does. It's only the third day of kinder. You can't read the word her if all you know is the individual letter sounds, because the word would be her. But you also can't read the word her if all you know is the secret, because then all you would know is the er. 
It takes two to tango. Kids need the individual letter sounds and the sounds they make together. And the more of each that they're accumulating, the more the odds are in their favor that they'll actually be able to get the word. Because now she's got her, 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 her. Hey, I can read that word. It's a shock to her too. <laughs> but you have to have both or you're just, you're just, you can't do it. So it takes both, which is why it's that, that letter sound, the better alphabet, it has to happen fast. That's why that two weeks to two months, you're simultaneously telling secrets. There's no reason not to play cars just because you're also singing a song. That's not overload on memory because none of it's actually going to higher level processing until it does. You know when it goes to higher level processing? When kids are ready to process it. When they start to notice, hey, huh, her, 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 I just, I just read that word. Like they're as shocked as you are because that never happened before. Like it's, words just start popping off the page. Now that's facilitated by the teacher modeling the heck out of this every chance she gets. Not just mindlessly writing the word the on the board after she just said Tisa's to but actually writing the word the on the board by going, huh, I don't see a letter in the alphabet that makes that sound. Oh, what do I, how do I write it? I don't, there's no letter that, it's a secret. What? It's a secret, it's over there. See the ones with the tongue sticking out? Again, they don't have to know the names, but you're, you're modeling, you're like leaving a breadcrumb trail and letting them lead you through the thinking that they'd have to use to write or to read. That's the key part, like you're just showing them these connections, showing them how you can get into all these special places with this key that you have. And they have the same key, look, it's in, it's in your pocket, it's right there. And then they eventually wake up, smell the coffee and go, oh, I got some of those keys, let me see what trouble I can get into. So that's where it's, you know, the little girl in my workshop, I don't know if, if they ever pulled on those strings and if they don't, it's gonna disappear. But if you do, it's gonna resonate for different kids at different times in different ways, like a buffet. Not all kids are ready to eat the chicken salad just because you put it out. They just want peanut butter. They think it looks yucky. Till they notice all the other kids getting that chicken salad. And then they start wondering what it must taste like. They know where it is. They know what it looks like. They just didn't need it yet. But when they do need it, they can help themselves because they've always known where it lives. They just didn't have an, a need to use it yet or to eat it yet. So that buffet analogy is a really good one, I think, for this. Now, stories are a key way to trigger these social emotional feeling based networks which are why they're just an easy in, but they gotta be stories kids already know. Not random crazy stories about Apple Annie and Farmer Fred and they get together and they are on a windmill and the windmill goes whoosh, whoosh, whoosh and then the SH goes shh. Like the more ambiguous the story is, the less connections kids are gonna be able to keep track of because they have to basically learn a whole story in order to remember the connection that the story is supposed to teach and if you're applying all of that to just read a word in a, in a sentence, you've gotten way, 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 way off track. So go with what they know. One thing all kids know are superheroes. Every kid knows the markers of a superhero. Superheroes have a superpower and they have a disguise so nobody will recognize them, especially like the villain, because there's always a villain and he always wants to steal the powers away from the superheroes. We're gonna take that already existing bucket and dump in the most important information that programs will wait a year to teach. And yet you can't read or write a single word without them. And they are the vowels. The vowels are the superheroes of the alphabet. They have a power that no other letter in the alphabet has. And if you teach upper grade or adult ed, this is where the kids need the most help. Even though it seems like it's the easiest thing, it is not. Vowels are in every syllable of every word and if kids aren't hooked into them, which typically with language deficits, that's their biggest issue, auditory delays, these vowels are a killer, the short vowels. Anyway, these vowels have a power that no other letter in the alphabet has. They can say their name but they don't want anybody to recognize them, so they have these little short and lazy disguises that they wear, and that's the sounds, those are the sounds that are tricky for kids. But we're not gonna go with the sounds, we're gonna go with an action or a feeling that's gonna land them in the sound without any thinking at all. For example, Miguel is gonna explain how to know what the short and lazy sound is for you. The superhero Will is short and lazy when he pretends he doesn't know anything, and he says, uh... But when there's trouble, he, he says, you. So what he's saying is, see, you likes to pretend that he's not paying attention in class. That way no one suspects he's a superhero. So every time the teacher calls on him, he always goes, ah, ah, ah. And that's a short and lazy sound. But that's also a, also a schwa sound, which means there's no lip position, no tongue position, which actually makes it harder for kids to hook because they want to position their mouth into a place. Like they want to... They want to make a specific sound. So if they move their tongue around or shift their mouth or their lip position around, they're going to end up in an eh, eh, ah, ah. It's very easy to move around. If you give it a hook to hang its hat on, 
ah, uh, now it's like it's got a place to live. It's instantly automated and retrievable. And that's a, that's a hard one because it's so ambiguous. E, we're gonna let um, this little one tell us about her short and lazy sounds. Hopefully. Okay, well. Okay. Ignore Miguel. But it can also now, E likes to pretend she's a sweet little old lady and, and she doesn't hear real well, so she'll always, because she doesn't want anybody to recognize her, and clearly she looks a lot like superhero E. So she just puts a big old bun on and some big glasses and she walks around, interrupts conversations on purpose and goes, eh? What'd you say, eh? Eh? And that's her little short and lazy disguise and then no one knows who she really is. Now these little cues can be given to kids all at once and have to be because they're part of the Better Alphabet song. So you can't start singing that on day one twice a day if kids don't know why you're doing this or this when you hit those sounds. Doesn't mean that you're teaching it and they have to know it. There's no expectation. It's not like a waitress when she puts your appetizer on your plate and you're not allowed to get your main meal till it's gone. It's a buffet. There could be 4,000 things served. You help yourself to what you need. It's up to you when you're ready to eat it. But my job is to make sure you've got what you need, like a plate and a napkin and a fork. And that's what the vowels are. There's no such thing as a word without a vowel. So if kids don't know them, they can't read anything. Nothing. And a lot of programs hold vowels off because they're the hardest to learn, and yet you can't read anything without them. The other thing they'll hold off is that there are two sounds for the vowels. Because a lot of times, and you'll see this on the next slide, there's a reason that they don't want kids to know this, which is a real problem. But all of these can be easily accessed, tossed out, and then played with all day long, every chance you get, just as you're making sense of words that you're reading and writing, anyway, in math, in science, in your reading lesson. The rest of them you can see on your download, so you'll have access to all of those. But what I want to get to is this. This was a tweet from a teacher. She said, we had a few superhero vows pay us a visit this week, since, and this is April 19th. She said, since we already knew the vowel sounds, we've known the vowels had more than one sound since the first week of school. So we didn't have to wait until this week in our phonics program to find out, but it was a fun review. Imagine not knowing vowels had two sounds until 10 months into school, or whatever it is at April 19th. That's unit 10 of 10 in a particular program. The reason they didn't want to tell them that the vowel sounds had a long sound is that's going to lead to the next question from kids, which is, well, how do I know which way it's going to go? Like, if you said A, could say A and A, how do I know when I see the word up there with the A in it, how do I know which one? And they didn't want to get into silent E till first grade. That was in unit one of the first grade curriculum. But that, that's not an excuse, because look how easy that can be. This little guy's in his third week of kindergarten. He's going to explain to you how he knows about mommy E and how she will let him, or let the vowel know what sound he's supposed to make. Interesting side note, this particular school, this, the principal rides a Segway with a GoPro on her head and rolls in and out of classrooms and live tweets all day. Isn't that neat? <laughs> so she live tweeted this and um, that was her little tweet. Well, actually, I think that's the teacher retweeting the principal's tweet, but isn't that cool? Like, imagine that. So if you're a parent, you just tune in anytime and chances are she'll be in and out of your child's classroom at least a couple times. So, when Molly E tells the I to say its name and like, so it says la, like, like. It says its I says its name like he's supposed to. See, if Mommy E is at the end of the word or one letter away from another vowel, she will tell that vowel that's one letter away, you say your name. And by darn it, you will, because I'm close enough. I have to reach over her head, get a hold of you. I will. <laughs> so kids know when mom's nearby, you do what you're supposed to. But if mom's not there, eh, maybe not. Maybe I'll be short and lazy. Now, if mom's there, but she's two letters away, like in the word butter, she can yell and scream all she wants. The downside of being um, a letter is your arms are only two inches long, so she can't reach over both of those T's to get a hold of that U and make him say his name, and that's why that word's butter instead of buter, because butter would turn into buter pretty darn fast if mommy E were one letter away from that U. So if you have kids who say they have buter on their toast because they spell buter or butter, B-U-T-E-R, all you have to do is say, you put buter on your toast, really? Really, buter? If you want that you to be short and lazy, you gotta move him further away from mommy. And then that puts them in a dilemma because they have to put another letter there. What letter? If you put a letter there, you're gonna have another sound. You don't want butler on your toast. You don't want butker on your toast. So what other letter could you put there that's not gonna add another sound to the mix? Oh, now it's a critical thinking exercise. How about another T? Because my teacher said if there's a double letter, I only make the sound one time, but that moves mommy away, gives me the short sound I want for butter, and doesn't add a new sound to the equation. So it gives kids a logical path to make sense of words instead of you just saying, you need to put another T there, and they're like, why? You just do. 
It just is. Just put the T there. The problem with that is only the kids who have access to books at home and parents at home and reading at home are going to remember that butter has two T's. The kids who don't have books in English at home or don't have books at home or don't have a home, like if they've got to rely on recognition of, of, of words from books that they don't have with parents who can't read them, th then they're locked out. But if they have a logical, analytical path that's, that they can make sense, like a breadcrumb trail, they're not locked out. They have power. Now, here's the thing. Sparkly E is not the same. Magic E is not the same. And that is because not every word has a pretty little E at the end of it. Kids need to be able to fry big fish. So mama's sometimes got to get out of the house, which means she puts a babysitter in charge. So boys and girls, if you see any vowel that is one letter away from another vowel, that is the babysitter. It's going to do exactly what mom would if she were there. It's going to tell any vowel that's one letter away, you say your name. And by darn it, you listen to mom, you're going to listen to Uncle Fred too. Every kid knows babysitters do what mom or dad would if they were there. So if you've got a word like motor or motorcycle or hibernate, all this means is kids know which way the vowel is going to go by looking to see if there's a mom or a babysitter. Just like if they're going to hit their friend Fred, the first thing you're going to do is look to see if the teacher's behind them. If you're behind them, they're not going to hit Fred. <laughs> but if you're outside the door talking to a, another teacher, they might decide to take the chance and hit Fred because it's unlikely you're going to see them. So it's just using as a compass what drives their behavior every day anyway, but now it lets them navigate decision making with words they've never laid eyes on before. And it just changes everything because you don't have to teach the reading, you can teach the reader. The reading can come and go. It's almost fun. Like, give me any word. Let's see what we can do. Give me supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And let me see if I can figure out how to like, plow my way through that. Or let me see if I can write it. There's so many ways you can play when kids have the building blocks. They could build an airport with their blocks, knock it down, build a teepee, knock it down, build a castle. The blocks can be creating anything. So there's no limit. When you teach the reader, the skill set's in them. When you teach the reading, you're having to teach all the words they need to recognize in the story. And there's no end to that. You can't possibly teach all the words. And it's so much harder. And so much longer. It's just a totally unnecessary. And if you're thinking babysitter vowels sound great, but like for fourth grade, this is an ELL kindergarten learner. His name is Abel. You can see more about his background and actually the progression of how this kind of comes together. I just want you to hear this 30 second clip of him explaining to the teacher how he knows what he knows. Because the teacher did not think he knew what he knew. She thought he was going to take a picture walk through this book because he just finished his individual letters and sounds in October. And she said, thanks to the better alphabet, he got all his individual letters and sounds by October. But she didn't think he was privy to any of the secrets that she'd been tossing out for the rest of the class, but she figured he wasn't ready for so he wouldn't know. Which is why she keeps saying, how did you know this? How did you know what sounds this made? And you can hear him explaining it, which is just, and that means she obviously did a great job offering this up to everybody, not just sequence, uh, sequestering it off in her small group. Hmm. Hmm. What do you need to do there? Is there a secret in that word? What is that I doing in that word? Think to that A. A. What does he tell that A to do? That's right. So try it again. A. E. Right. The. How. Luke. Gotcha. And I meant to play, and by the way, look, O-O, oh, oh, that's a secret, and he had to switch sounds because it's U and U, uh, and he had to flip from one to the other, but I like that he didn't just say the word. You could tell he had to think about it for a minute. He had to kind of figure it out, and that's what we want. Not one time did he look at the teacher and wait for her to tell him. Like, that wasn't even an option on the table. He had, it was interesting to see a kid who should feel so powerless over text feel so powerful over text that he's like, just let me tinker a little bit. I, let me just go slow. Let me just, let me just figure it out. And I, I think this clip helps to play first this to see that. Hibernate. Hibernate. How do you know that says hibernate? Why does it say I? Because the mama E. The mama E. And what do these two say? Er. Er. What is that A getting to say its name? It's mama E. Right. Now look at down here. What's what happening with this word? Hibernate. Hibernate. Remember? It sounds like hibernated. 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 Yeah, because it's a little different. Good job. Now that like three minutes is such a valuable time as opposed to a kid just practicing recitation of a sentence he's been doing all week. Like what's the point of that? To just have kids practice saying a bunch of words that they actually can't 
crack like that. Much better to slow it down and let him fiddle, let him play, let him talk through it, let him show you how he knows what he knows, let you show him how to figure out what he doesn't know. Like that's real reading. And it's, it's hard to see that because for so long, real reading, and, and this is where I kind of understand why phonics went away. It can't be, you can't put the worst show on for the worst audience. You can't, you can't perform Shakespeare for kindergartners. Like, phonics went away because phonics is really hard and it's very abstract and it's gonna immediately cause kids to disengage if it slashes and dashes and, and digraphs and diphthongs and triphthongs and scribbles and nasalizations and six syllable types and open and close. Kids are looking for doors in words when you say, you know, vowel, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, divide between, and I'm not saying not to say this, don't, don't, I'm saying, don't make this the bar that if Johnny can't get over, then you just can't read these words. Sorry, Johnny, sorry. When you can follow my line of logic with vowel, consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, if it's vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, we divide between the two consonants, thus then the vowel, it's called, we call that a closed syllable, that then dictates the vowel would be short. However, if it's vowel, consonant, vowel, we divide after the vowel, that's what we call an open syllable, in which case that vowel would be long. This is a great trick to help you make your way down the word list on page 47. Now, the kids who are, abs are concrete thinkers, they're looking for long and short letters, like the L is long, the short, the O is short. They're looking for open and closed, like real open closed. Like I don't see words that are open doors and closed doors. There's nothing wrong with giving the high level terminology. Kids actually love to feel so smart, but it can't be the bar that if they're not developmentally able to get over it, then they're just not allowed access to the word. If mommy E and babysitter vowels get them actually decoding those words with ease, give them that ability first. Now they're primed for you to back up and say, you know what this really is? You know what you're actually able to do? What this really is, is this. And now you can go back and connect those terms that you learn in letters. You know, letters is a fabulous training for teacher knowledge and skill set. But teachers have to have deliverable buckets to get it to the end user, who, again, is five or six or seven or really heavily struggling at those upper grades. Now, I'm going to wrap. I want to get, I've got about four minutes before I'm going to introduce you to somebody who's going to pull a lot of this together. Um, and we're working on, she's been helping out with a meta-analysis with these 25 case studies coming out that's all about early, fast access, these backdoor connections, early brain development, and these schema-driven mnemonics, embedded mnemonics, which are these visuals, melodic mnemonics, which is connecting pitch, rhythm, and, and information together, but keeping it malleable and flexible by not letting it turn into a song that's autopilot. Um, and then also mnemonics in terms of the schematic story mnemonics. So, She's going to pull it together. What I want to show you, I want to get to one slide that I think is going to really hammer this home. But first, I do want to tell you about the Lex Luthor of the alphabet. This is Sneaky Y. He will only be sneaky, like all good sneaks are, when he can't be seen. So when he is at the end of a word where he doesn't think anybody can see him, he will always be sneaky and he'll always be making his E or his I sound. Or if he's in the middle of a word, buried between other letters where he's pretty sure he's hidden. But when he's front and center, and he's the line leader of the word, and he knows all eyes are on him, he does just what a good letter should. Yeah, 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 yes, you, yak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when he's at the end, he'll always be sneaky. In words like my, or by, or candy, or daddy, or sky. Now, if you're wondering about words like play, or they, or boy, different secret, because that's not why by itself. This is just why by itself. It follows the same rules kids do. When they are the line leader, they're an angel falling to the sky. When they are the caboose, all bets are off, and you never know what that behavior is gonna end up being. Because he, like the kids, makes those decisions based on where he is. Now, this is Fonzie. I know many of you are too young to know who Fonzie is. So this teacher is gonna make sure you understand who Fonzie is, so you're connected with this other sound that Y can make, but only when it's E-Y or A-Y. A-Y and E-Y. These letters are just too cool. So, with thumbs up and their coolest voices, they say, Hey. Hey. Fonzie's just timeless, isn't he? Like, even all you young ones that are laughing, like, you didn't know who Fonzie is, you probably still don't, but now, that makes sense, hey. Now, what this does is it gives kids best betting odds for Las Vegas with a skill they're not supposed to have until the end of second grade because it is so high level, but it's also high leverage. You get a lot of bang for your buck when you can play around with that Y sound because it is everywhere. It's probably the most commonly occurring trickster in all print rich text at the earliest grade level. So it's such a shame that you can't have it at the early grade levels. You have to wait until the end of second grade. And even then a lot of kids don't get it. They just remember the words. 
Best betting odds for Las Vegas means you can give a kid any word you want and let them play, let them fiddle, let them make decisions, most likely, next most likely, some other tricks I've got up my sleeve to try. And it's not just words like my, it's words like symphony or epiphany. Um, any word that has a Y in it, are kids armed to come to it and know a course of attack, or does the teacher have to keep telling the word? At upper grades, those, those teachers don't know how to cue a kid when they can't read a word. They just tell them the word. And after the pandemic, there's way too many kids that don't know way too many words for the teacher to sustain being everybody's go-to girl for every single word they can't read and spell. They have to have a way to get them off of them and onto something that's independent that can actually live inside of their gut moving through the grade levels. Because that teacher with that good heart isn't gonna necessarily be the same teacher the next year who's gonna look at them like, what? I'm not spelling that word for you. You go back and figure that out or get your dictionary. So they learn how to work around what they can't read instead of actually getting back what they never got when they were at the grade levels where it, it was supposed to come up. Um, and that's a, that's a norm right now for our kids. So this is my last slide before I have Marnie pop up, but this is a Stanford brain study that I actually was talking about as early as late 2014, before Science of Reading was really on the, the, the radar. And, well, at least before it was on the main radar. And I used to have to convince everybody that it's just so handy to have this thing called the code. Like your kids don't have to learn a bunch of words, they can actually read them. The beauty of, of what is happening now is you don't have to convince anyone anymore that you need the code to crack the code. Now it's just a matter of how do we do that? How do we make that accessible to our teachers, to our students? Like how do we work this into what's already happening, whatever our curriculum already is, our programs already are. But this study was a great persuasion piece because they looked at kids as they were attacking words, and I say they, they actually had um, um, neural image scans looking at word attack where active decoding was occurring versus word calling to see where optimal brain circuitry lie. And there was no contest. There was absolutely no optimal brain circuitry occurring when kids were just calling words. But when kids had to actually plow through those sounds to figure out those words, that's where all the value lie. Now the problem was Stanford University doesn't normally work with primary grades, so they didn't understand how this wasn't so helpful when they simply said, so teachers never have kids memorize words, they can just read. Just let them read them. They didn't realize, hey, we're not memorizing words for fun, we're memorizing words because the phonic skills in them haven't been taught yet. If you're in kindergarten, you have to read the word how or the or she, how are we supposed to do that if the phonic skills for those sounds are in first or second grade respectively? Yet we have to read those words now, thus all the memorization. And some states have 200 words that kids have to memorize before they're allowed to go to second grade because that's how much taxing on the memorization requirements there were. And all of that time spent memorizing only depletes time spent actually learning how to read. Because the kids, by the way, who need the most time get the least at home, which means you have to do more at school. So those kids are getting shortchanged with reading strategies because somebody's got to flash the card 45,000 times in the hopes that they can remember the word. And we don't want to remember the word, we want to read it. So imagine if you have, you know, the, I'm going to add this last part, but the prize for memorizing a sight word is you get one word out of that deal. When you own the key to crack that word, you get thousands of words. So if you have the ah sound, you can not just read August and Saw, but you could read Doddle. Or if you have the A sound, it's not just they and day, you could read decay. Not that you'd want to read decay. Um, though, devour, thrombosis, hamburger, I mean, come up with whatever, system, any words, any words, no matter how big those words are, it's the same building blocks. So it's so much easier to learn the building blocks and then apply it to everything and teach the reader and not the reading. Teaching the reading, no brain circuitry that's of any value. Teaching the reader, it's actually a fanfold effect. Not just the same fanfold effect that Marnie's gonna talk about, Dr. Ginsburg, but a fanfold effect from a comprehension end because one of the other things they found, and maybe you can touch on this as well, but um, they found that when um, kids are actively decoding a word, the, the, they're using the, the left hemisphere of the brain. When kids are calling a word, they're using the right hemisphere. And it's actually the left hemisphere engagement that's kicking in when kids are um, comprehending and actually reading. So priming it by using it for decoding means those kids are actually more capable then of applying it for the task of putting thoughts together to get a whole, which is meaning. Because on a rudimentary level, that's what they're doing when they're actively decoding sounds. So we don't want to train the brain to read wrong, and we don't want to engage the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is where our weak readers show engagement at the upper grades. The left hemisphere is where our strong readers show it. So what I want to do is ask um, Dr. Ginsburg to pop up for about 10 minutes because she's going to share some really valuable tools for how teachers can take 
and play with these things to really rethink whatever your existing curriculum is, but to give them more power in, in kind of making it impactful for kids. So this is Dr. Ginsburg, and she is working with me on a research study, and she's also uploaded some things you're gonna be able to download free um, in that group. So please make sure you access your handout to get those. I'll just pop over here. So I, can you hear me? So I'm actually gonna just take five minutes. We're gonna see how fast we can go through this one little point to extend the research. I actually have a secret for you about research. When you think about research, don't you normally just kinda of wanna tune out? <laughs> but this is a secret, um, a different type than what Katie was talking about that I think you probably haven't heard before and it builds a good rationale to continue what Katie has begun to make the case for, that we can release phonics information to kids a lot earlier. Um, so we're gonna think about we're gonna start with Keith Stanovich's really, really influential Matthew Effects paper. Matthew Effects in Reading, it was in 1986. It's like the Casey Kasem's top 40 hits in the reading research world. It's been um, cited over a thousand times. And th the Matthew Effects idea he brought up was from the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus said the rich get richer. And he extended that metaphor to say, hey, if you get a good start at reading, then you are going to be more likely to have a rich get richer kind of experience. You're gonna be a great reader down the path. And the evidence that he put in this very deep paper demonstrated that. Um, how many of you have heard of the Matthew Effects paper? Great, so it's been cited over a thousand times, but it's, there's a secret behind it that we've kind of ignored. So we're gonna go backwards from the conclusions to explain why it's so important that we release this information to, to kids. So here's how you would map out the Matthew effect. A kid who's young, three, four, five, six, get, may get a quick start to sound-based decoding because he or she has good phonemic awareness or was taught phonemic awareness. As a result, then they start to identify words. They become orthographically mapped. They've learned them in a split second. So then, when that's happened, these kids enjoy reading. And so then those kids enjoy um, reading and so they have self-efficacy with reading. And then they read more words. Do you hear a little bit of a, when you give a mouse a cookie thing going on here? You start with this and then there's this positive snowball. They acquire more words and they build more vocabulary and then they have more motivation. And, and it's just this positive snowball that those kids, those Matthew effects kids, they were the rich, they started out well and they got better and better. Reading became a breeze. How many of you have seen these types of kids? Um, well, they're, they're quite common. It's, we're not talking about just a few elite gifted kids. This positive snowball will happen for many of your students. Um, and guess how early it can, you can see the whole result of it. Even as early as... <laughs> Come on, clicker. Mid to end of first grade. So very early on, these Matthew Effect kids are already getting... Um, the hang of reading, and they're, they feel great about it. You can recognize these kids because they can read text like this, like Frog and Toad. How many of you have kids who can pick this up in kindergarten or first grade? Frog and Toad, Little Bear, Messy Bessie, Henry and Mudge. So I'm gonna ask you, does our current system give the typical child access to this type of text by the middle of first grade? No, I'm seeing those heads shaking. No, not typically, for some of the same reasons that Katie's been talking about. We are keeping our kids trapped in short vowel world. How many of your curricula are just keeping kids with consonants and short vowels? Ah, eh, eh, ah, ah. Usually it's all of kindergarten, and then even sometimes well into first grade. The same thing happens with intervention. They're gonna spend so much time in short vowel world, months, sometimes a year. So, maybe a little later they get some consonant digraphs like the SH and um, shop. So these kids who are not getting exposure to how the code actually works, they cannot read this type of text. Notice all the yellow words, those are words that come from the top 300 high frequency words, like your top 300 fry words. That makes up 65% of written text. So these words, these yellow words here in Frog and Toad, they're in every book that's a transitional text like this. 
And look at what you need to be able to read these words. You need the O in toad, the A in day, the I in time, the I in my, the er in letter. There's this information that Katie's been talking about. We're holding it back. We're keeping a glass ceiling on it. But kids need this. There's so much there beneath the surface. I guess you got to be over here to make the clicker work. <laughs> so one solution that Katie's been building the case for, and we can even see from this Matthew FX paper, is we got to tell the truth about the code. We can't keep kids in short vowel land or in one letter, one sound for a whole year because that's not how our code works. Remember she says our brains are pattern-making machines? They can't pick up this pattern if it's always one letter, one sound. Similarly, if we tell them that one sound is always just you know, one spelling combination like OA, they're not building that schema, and they're not learning the truth about our code. We can release this information a lot earlier. That O can be the O and go, the O and home, the O and show, the O and toe. And you can do this really quickly with kids. It's not actually that hard. One thing you might do, say your curriculum says it's time to introduce O as o -O OA, and that's the first O sound they've encountered. Well, you can write then and there, whip out a piece of paper, a few O sound words like um, go, road, show, toe, most. Have them read those words and sort them by spelling. So they're going to build a mental schema, mental framework that O can be multiple spellings. And that's kind of telling them the truth about how the code works. It's going to give them access to those texts like frog and toad. It's not actually that hard for them. We have lots of videos on, on our website. You can get, as Katie said, through that Facebook group, there's a file where you can see access. Um, you can gain access for seeing this in action. I'll also share like um, some activity sheets and decodable text that would align with this. So here's our sorted page. And you could do it with a notebook paper, but um, and you can use this as an example with your kids, see how easy it is, and then you can read some of the text we'll share as an example that are all the O spellings in a text. So it's not just OA, it's you've released a lot. So this is the secret from that Matthew FX paper. Even though it's been so widely cited, we haven't thought about the consequences of knowing, ah, those kids that got off to a good start, what is it that we have to do to get all of our kids to that point? We haven't kind of backward mapped. And today, I think Katie's made a good logical case, and there's some evidence from the research to suggest that when we release this advanced phonics information a lot earlier, we're going to be more likely to have all of our kids be the so-called Matthew Effect kids. Everyone deserves that rich getting richer opportunity. And so they can read books like Frog and Toad, Messy Bessie, and then quickly move into like early chapter books. So I know Katie's going to... Oh, yeah. One thing I didn't get to say is if you have followed um, some of the work of Science of Reading, Seidenberg, Dr. Seidenberg is one of the thought leaders of Science of Reading, and he's mentioned Marnie specifically as this need for speed to not make things more complicated and slow it down, how to simplify it and speed it up. And one of the things that he pointed to was Marnie and Reading Simplified as this process of knowledge for teachers to just put them into this mindset of it's not about how hard we can make it and how complicated it can be. It's about getting kids reading. And, you know, as she's talking about the Matthew effect, the poor get poor and the rich get richer. The kids who don't like to read avoid reading. The, worse they, the less they read, the worse they get and so on. And the opposite for kids who are. So every point that she made, um, she's, she's really one of... I say he's a thought leader. You're a thought leader as well in that movement. But the, what draw, drew me to, Mar, uh, to Marnie, or to Dr. Ginsburg, it was Dr. Ginsburg before last night, really. <laughs> but she's just, the mindset is there, and the eye is on the ball. It's about getting kids reading, getting all kids reading, and not overcomplicating something that should be simple. So um, if you do any reading, you'll come across her name a lot. But the good part is you'll see a lot of the, um, the research support for this in some of the sections that she's writing in this meta-analysis, which I'm excited about because this is the stuff teachers need to chew on. 
But I know our districts sometimes need to chew on the other stuff that goes underneath it. You know, what is this based on? How does this come to be? So hopefully after today, you'll be able to download what you need to jump into the classroom, start doing this tomorrow, and give your admin things, or if admin's here, you know, give them a way to make sense of some of this research that's really falling on everybody right now, and we have to make sense of it. We can't lose more kids, especially after the pandemic. But I want to thank you so much for joining me, and I apologize that you couldn't have more time, but I am so appreciative of you guys coming and staying later. Thank you so, so, so much. And we will both be at the author's signing table, which I have to find. I don't know where that is yet, but I'll be headed there wherever it is. And uh, you're welcome to follow up with either one of us um, and ask any questions. And you're also welcome to email either of us as well. So you'll have all that in, in your pack. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.